My main task this evening is somewhat strange, as I have to welcome our speaker to his own organization <laughs> and his own stage. But it is a very great pleasure to do so. Dr. Robin Niblett has been director of Chatham House since 2007, a post which Tim once held, and Robin has brought great distinction to the post. He has a great record in international and strategic thinking from appointments in the United States. He's highly regarded on both sides of the Atlantic as well as further afield, as demonstrated in his award of CMG, which reflects so very well on him and on Chatham House. And in addition, I gather he has only just arrived in from the Far East. He's in great demand at conferences, and he's been invited to give evidence to committees in the House of Commons, as well as the House of Representatives and the Senate, particularly on European affairs. I'm very pleased to see that he is a linguist and adds his voice to the campaign to increase language proficiency in the UK. He's a musician married to an artist, so very definitely an all-rounder. Now, he's speaking tonight on Britain's place in the world following the general election. It's at a time where our, our international role is one on which not all politicians are agreed. And Robin, we look forward very much indeed to hearing what you have to say. Dr. Robin Niblett. Thank you very much, Sue. And um, you're right, this is strange to have it this way around. Um, and uh, I've, I've become quite comfortable actually doing the Q&A and being able to drop in and out, bouncing off what the uh, speaker said. And this time I'm going to have to uh, hopefully deliver some goods for you to be able to pick up off. Um, but it, it's actually a great honor to be giving uh, the Tim Garden Memorial Lecture this year. So a big thanks to you, Sue, to Robert, to uh, all of your colleagues for giving me the opportunity to do this. Um, it's uh, great to have an opportunity to be able to honor Tim. Um, I would say to uh, our staff here that the people at Chatham House at any one time are Chatham House. It isn't this kind of reputational issue that goes backwards and forwards. The reputation is built at each moment. And as uh, I well know, and uh, Victor Palmer Thomas, my uh, predecessor and sort of Tim's successor, uh, well know that uh, he put in place the foundations on which we've been able to build, and at a very, very important time for the Institute uh, when it really needed his kind of leadership. So it's a chance for me to say a big thank you. Um, the one thing I want to apologize for is um, sort of giving the same topic talk as Ming Campbell in the end, because although I'm going to do Britain's place in the world, um, I'm conscious that at the moment, and especially a year after this election with the referendum coming up, that actually Europe and Britain's place in the world are tightly uh, interconnected. Um, but I don't want to talk about the negotiations on, uh, that, are undergo that are undergoing right now or how to win a yes vote um, or whether a no vote uh, has merit. I'm not going to go in that direction. Um, I want to take this opportunity to reflect, uh, reflect on the link between Europe and Britain's place in the world. Um, obviously, these are my personal reflections, which I look forward to refining, I might add, as well. Um, but it's a great opportunity to get some feedback uh, and share them with you today. And I want to make a specific argument or test, you know, I might say, a specific argument with you uh, that the important changes taking place both domestically and internationally make obsolete the notion of a Britain that can chart its own destiny by balancing equally between its diverse channels of influence. Uh, the idea of returning to a sort of neo-Elizabethan age of British foreign policy, which I think has been partly the idea since 2010, the idea of looking out to the world while downplaying the platform of the Euro-Atlantic uh, base, implied a level of sort of independent choice for Britain that I don't think will reflect the reality or Britain's national interests in the future. Yes, Britain has notable strengths. I wrote about them five years ago when... Um, we had a last change of government, and they certainly give it an opportunity to be more influential than most uh, countries its size. But in the future, it's going to have relatively limited resources, relatively limited resources, and it's going to need a geopolitical base uh, from which to ensure its prosperity, protect its security, and project its interests. And as imperfect as the EU is on all levels, and I know as a student of the European Union, I think it offers the main source of leverage for Britain in a world where leverage is essential. 
And I think unless British policymakers accept the fact that the country's strategic strength is going to be linked inexorably with that of its European neighbours, then brisk Britain risks seeing its influence decline uh, structurally and not just temporarily. Structurally, not just temporarily. So let me start, first of all, with a couple of comments about the decline thesis. How real is it? Strengths and weaknesses. Then I want to talk a little bit about where the UK stands in this changing world. Um, and then do a little bit of a very quick historical look at Britain's uh, adjustments that it made in the past to a changing strategic order. And then I want to sort of argue why I believe the UK will need to recognize that the EU countries and EU institutions uh, must be the first inner circle for Britain's international influence, surrounded then by the transatlantic relationship and reaching out beyond that to bilateral and multilateral relationships. As somebody who has the opportunity uh, and privilege of traveling a lot, um, I'm struck by the sense that Britain is in decline that you hear as you travel around the world. I was on this platform with a couple of American uh, colleagues uh, and uh, one Brit, Timothy Gart Nash, in the lead up to the election. And it was all never in 25 years, never in 35 years, you know, have I seen Britain uh, in so much decline. I found myself, I have to say, resisting uh, the theory as much as they put it forward. But why this debate now? I think partly uh, it's perceptions. And the perception is that at one level on security, Britain has moved from being on the team on the field to being on the reserve bench of international security. The non-decision to go into Syria, the semi-involvement uh, militarily in terms of taking on IS stand out as examples. Second, the government's carried out some pretty severe cuts to its defense capabilities, but in particular to power projection, uh, the size of its naval forces, um, the lack, obviously, temporarily at least, of an aircraft carrier projection capacity. Senior US officials have been outspoken in their concerns about the long-term risks of the UK as a kind of P5 um, contributor to international security. Third, there is the referendum on the EU and the uncertainty this puts into Britain's place in the world, and the insecurity uh, that it brings that maybe Britain, even after the referendum, might not be able to reestablish its relationship exactly right. Fourth, and we must remember, the kind of broader moorings of Britain's influence have also begun to drift. Uh, for 70 years, the UK, in a way, was a privileged nation at the heart of a Western order. Um, it risks being less influential in a UN of rising powers, less significant in a leaderless G20 than in a world when the G7 led. So you can see there's a combination of reasons why I think this idea of structural uh, decline has taken on uh, a certain element of uh, consistency. However, and this is a Chatham House, a place where we do on the one hand, on the other hand, however, I think uh, Britain actually is doing pretty well despite this structural decline. These are points I made in the talk. I mean, this is a country that's had to halve its deficit over the last five years, and yet has come out of the crisis um, with one of the fastest rates of economic growth in uh, the OECD, one of the lowest rates of unemployment, uh, one of the most popular destinations in the world for foreign direct investment, top in the EU, uh, second in terms of stock only to the United States, ahead of China and Germany of foreign direct investment. Um, it is also uh, proving particularly attractive to emerging markets. India and China are making the UK their main destination for foreign investment. And despite some pretty tough regulatory changes, the City of London has retained its position as one of the top two preeminent cities for financial issues in the world. It's the largest exporter of services, etc. And even on international, um, uh, in the international realm, uh, the UK continues to be in the top realm of its capacity to exert influence. It's had a 19% cut uh, in its defense budget, but it's still the fifth largest defense spender in the world, with power projection coming back into its armory in uh, about five to 10 years' time. And despite a 16% cut in the FCO's budget, it still retains a global platform of embassies, um, and actually an increase in much of the emerging world, with particular increases in. Uh, Beijing, New Delhi, but also some of the mid-sized countries, South Korea, Malaysia, Nigeria, Vietnam, Pakistan, etc. And as people constantly point out, but you all know, to remind you, one of the best networked countries in terms of international 
institutions. And I think it's actually used those networks quite cleverly. I think the uh, period of the presidency of the G8 in 2013, um, Britain used its kind of hub position to push uh, an agenda of open government, tax openness, uh, avoiding the, the, the tax evasion uh, debate that has now become so prevalent around the world was pushed really from a British uh, agenda at that time. Cyber security, internet governance, combating sexual violence. The UK has sort of taken on the role um, of playing a thought leader on new international challenges. And I should, of course, remind us all that we have now one of the largest uh, foreign aid budgets, second largest spender of official ODA of, of overseas development assistance in the world, uh, and a highly respected security and intelligence services. Um, having just skimmed on my mobile phone this morning, this is where the Bruges Group report stops, by the way. So those of you who want to read it, it gives the list of all the good things. Um, and let me just now go to the stuff that isn't so good, which are the challenges. Because I think although the UK survived the financial crisis relatively unscathed, um, it now faces some pretty serious challenges that will persist through this parliament and potentially beyond. The first are in the economic space. Um, the UK might have cut the deficit in half, but it still has one of the largest deficits in Europe, close to 5% of GDP. Um, as a result, its debt to GDP is now around 80%. We're spending 3% uh, roughly of our GDP on debt servicing, obviously about a third higher than we're spending on our defense budget. Um, and despite the most optimistic scenarios, surpluses stand quite a long way off and with some really severe cuts that would need to be undertaken, which at times seem difficult to be able to understand how they'll take place. If there's no tax rise is going to happen, we have uh, key areas of social spending ring-fenced. Certainly, the tools of international influence are likely to be the ones that will be hit as a result. And the FCO may have still ended up through the last parliament with a global spread, but is a thin spread. Um, a m big shift, a uh, continuing big shift in greater use of local staff, a gradual loss of uh, longer term career FCO staff as a result of the change of final salary pensions um, and other restrictions on compensation, uh, lack of investment in technology infrastructure when that becomes so important in being able to communicate messages and reacting quickly to changing events. And while the MOD has some big investment coming in, um, certainly military officials and others that I hear commenting on these issues and those who study these issues more closely than I do, point out we might end up with a lot of good kit, but we're without the troops to be able to carry out and, and implement them and, and use the stuff. Um, and therefore our capacity to project might end up being theoretical uh, more than real. Um, and even DFID with its strong budget has found its staff cut heavily under the current uh, cuts. So the tools for international influence are likely to remain under pressure for quite a long time into the future. At the same time, the UK is running 5% of GDP trade deficit as well. Um, and uh, our currently good stock um, of balance of payments, our large stock of overseas investments are not providing the same returns that they used to in the past to make up for our uh, deficit in trade of goods, if not in services. Uh, ultimately, the UK is not a productive country. We do not spend sufficient amounts on R&D. We have aging physical infrastructure, low levels of educational attainment in the primary and secondary levels, a shortage of long-term capital for new businesses. Um, these were challenges when the government came into power. They were challenges that emerged under the Labour government. Um, we still have them today at the start of the new parliament. I think the second point I want to say quickly domestically is that there's a big question as to whether this sort of perception of decline is cyclical or structural. I hear many people say, well, it's cyclical. When the money comes in, we can go back to doing what we were doing before. But I think this ignores the change in British politics, and not just British politics, politics throughout Europe, um, with a fragmentation in the power of established parties, uh, a rise of parties like the SNP uh, and also UKIP, one obviously represented heavily in Parliament, not, and the other not but with UKIP 13% of the British population, with a highly skeptical view of international affairs, not just about Europe, but also about the United States. I say both those parties are actually Euro and US skeptic, and they will have uh, a stronger voice. Um, we're also going to have the UK that spends its time fixated not just on the EU referendum, um, but also on 
a whole series of constitutional adjustments, maybe an English parliament, certainly more devolution to Scotland, maybe to some of the other national parliaments, cities. Um, we're going to have more voices involved in British foreign policy. Uh, and the idea that we can go back somehow to a period um, where foreign policy could be made in Westminster, paying attention here and there to shifts in public policy, but not being led by them, I think uh, that is fanciful. Um, ultimately, uh, I think we're going to end up in a situation where there is a structural shift towards a much more cautious engagement in foreign policy affairs than we had in the past, not only because of the economic shortages and our capabilities, but also the changing nature of British politics. Now, this, the timing for this isn't great. Uh, and this is why I want to move to the second point, which is the external context in which Britain is operating currently. Um, look, the external context holds many positive features. I don't want to underplay them. Um, we'll go from roughly 1.8 billion to probably 3 billion people in the middle class uh, by 2030 if growth continues in the emerging markets the way it's done so far. And that will create great opportunities for British businesses, British employment, British jobs, and further inward investment. But I work at Chatham House, and I've got to point out the negatives as well and the risks. If we don't point out the risks, we don't deal with them. And I think there are three in particular. The first there are, is that there are winners and losers of globalization. And the losers don't want to be losers, and the winners want to make sure that their winning continues. There is a highly mercantilist approach to globalization amongst many countries, vying to develop national champions uh, to protect or cultivate strategic industries under non-tariff barriers. Um, and they're also looking to raise their voice in international economic institutions. Britain is going to have to watch out that it doesn't become one of the losers, given the productivity challenges it faces right now. There's also a much bigger geopolitical dimension to this winner-loser dimension. I think Russia is trying to avoid declining further, being a bigger loser than it's already been. Uh, the United States and China are duking out over who is going to be the stronger in the Asia Pacific. The Middle East is worried about the rise of Iran. If it loses, if it no longer is operating under sanctions, it can tap in to the power of globalization. And the UK could find itself pulled into some of these conflicts, given its P5 role, um, its strong security relationships with the United States, with the Middle East, with the Gulf countries. But in terms of political cohesion, material resources, and international influence, it's going to find this a very difficult call to answer. I mean, secondly, international institutions are not emerging to deal with the pressures of globalization. Uh, the UN Security Council is increasingly in standoff. IMF and the World Bank are losing legitimacy. WTO is paralyzed. It means that the risk of spillover from this competition between winners and losers is much greater than in the past. And the US, I think we can talk maybe more about it later on in, in Q&A, um, is ambivalent about the kind of role it should play there. We might hear plenty of American political leaders saying we want to have the US going back to being a strong leader. But I would argue that Barack Obama is probably more in tune with the American people um, than many of the members of Congress and critics on the right um, say. Uh, the idea of offshore balancing, as people have described it, is much more tempting to many Americans than intervention in the future. Um, in the end, what we're seeing, actually, in this unpredictable institutional environment is countries are grouping together in regions in ways to deal with problems that they find they can't deal with at a global level. So it's not just the European Union, but it's the African Union, the Pacific Alliance, in Latin America, ASEAN, the Eurasian Union, the global, sorry, the Gulf uh, Cooperation Council. Each of these are trying to find benefits amongst uh, the like-minded. I think the implications of this shift for the UK are significant because the extent to which power continues to drain away from the Bretton Woods institutions, the UK's ability to promote its interests in those institutions will decline. And to the, to the extent that we have greater a great power competition, particularly between the United States, China, Russia. Uh, I think the voice, uh, the UK will find that its voice is more diluted in this kind of unstructured world. Uh, and in the same vein, however close or special the UK relationship is with the US, it will increasingly become one amongst a number of key bilateral relationships. The third key sort of 
external challenge which I wanted to point out uh, is to do with the issue of state fragmentation. State fragmentation is happening all over the world in different ways, even in Europe. But the place where it's in its most violent form is in our neighborhood to the south in the Middle East and North Africa, the East Mediterranean, where we're really seeing powerless, ineffective governments uh, allowing and a, a growing youthful population with no sense of opportunity, uh, allowing their countries to be torn apart along sectarian uh, and tribal lines. As much as the UK and the US, their allies, try to bottle this up, we could end up, I think, in Europe with a lawless zone, something akin to Afghanistan and Pakistan on our neighborhood with the risks of terrorism, uncontrolled immigration uh, that, could, that could come from this. So as Britain looks to the future, it's finding that its neighborhood is now almost one of the crucibles of international instability. Uh, and I think the kind of tactical adjustments that governments have been taking in the last 10 to 15 years don't fully capture the nature of the changes. So let me come now to uh, the third part of my remarks, which is how has Britain adjusted the past and how should we think about the future? You know, Britain is a country that's pretty pragmatic and has made adjustments when it's had to in the past. You know, Winston Churchill talked about Britain's three interlocking circles, uh, the empire, the English-speaking world, principally the United States, and Europe. Um, ultimately, he saw Britain sitting at that intersection between those interlocking circles, equally influential, ideally, in all three. Well, the Suez Crisis of 1956 put paid uh, to that imperial vocation that Britain wanted to remain kept the Commonwealth, but ultimately it put itself in a position of a junior partner to the US in the Cold War. Um, but the economic decline in the 60s and the 70s then made Britain realize it needed to commit to Europe uh, at the same time. So although our relationship with Europe has always been awkward, uh, we did not join up, obviously, to the single currency after its launch. Um, we ended up in a sort of uneasy combination of those three relationships, principally the transatlantic and European, but always with that ambition to try to reclaim some of the international imperial, you might call it, or post-imperial connectivity. Um, in the 21st century, we've explored this interestingly. David Miliband really pushed the idea of a hub Britain, yeah? taking advantage of its NGOs, language, London as a capital city, time zones. Uh, uh, he argued that Britain should be that global thought leader for 21st century challenges. And interestingly enough, the David Cameron coalition government we just had continued that view, this idea of Britain being at the center of a web of global networks. Um, I think he wanted to wean Britain off, personally, its instinctive deference to the US and also its obsession with Europe. Uh, in a way, it was a return to Britain sitting at the intersection of Churchill's interlocking circles. But now, commercial diplomacy would be the reconnection to the world. And I think over the last five years, there has been some progress um, in this direction. In particular, we look at China, a wobbly start to the bilateral relationship after the Dalai Lama's visit. But since then, uh, Britain has been touted as the center for internationalization, the renminbi. Um, and Britain's exports to China have, have doubled from about 7.3 billion to 15, 16 billion over the last five years. But really, this rebalance has only been partially successful you'd have to pick particular countries to identify them. Um, Russia, far from becoming an energy partner, uh, has become an adversary. Gulf states are wary of letting Britain too close to them, even commercially now, following the Arab Spring and Britain's initial support for the Muslim Brotherhood. India, I think, has ignored the idea of the special relationship that was put forward in the coalition's initial uh, agreement uh, back in 2010. It's turned its focus really much more to the US. Um, and things actually may get tougher. The emerging economies, China, Brazil, South Africa, are entering really complex transitions to move into middle income status and are finding this transition, as we've seen in particular in Turkey and Brazil, very difficult indeed. At the same time, our relationship with Europe has ended up in the complex environment that we all know, and I'm not going to repeat here. Um, we know the roots of the decision of why we're standing in front of a referendum. Whatever the roots of that decision, we're now in a position where Britain is seen, as Herman van Rompuy put it, as being engaged in Europe with one hand on the door, or one hand on the door handle, uh, which makes it difficult 
to be influential in Europe the way it was in the past. And the United States um, has also become a bit frustrated, I'd say, with the UK. I had one senior US official who described uh, to me uh, Britain's self-indulgent obsession with Europe, as she put it. Um, uh, and ultimately, this has fed the diversification of the US's relationships to Germany uh, over the Euro, uh, to France, to a certain extent on security issues in the Middle East and the Sahel. Um, and this has compounded the concern about the defense cuts. At the core of the problem, I suppose this is my point, or my thesis, um, is that this continuing desire of British leaders to have maximum international flexibility, to have Britain either as a pivot or a hub or a bridge or a connecting node in a networked world, or as William Hague uh, once put it, a hub with many spokes coming out of it. Each of these concepts imply that Britain can pursue a foreign policy that can face in multiple directions simultaneously. I don't think this approach works anymore. It's not just that it's difficult in practical terms to have your cake and eat it in terms of how you fo face in multiple directions simultaneously. It's that the shifts in world order are coinciding with this decline in the UK's relative material capacities and its ability to apply material, uh, so international leverage. Ultimately, I don't think Britain can think of itself anymore, and it, maybe it's an arrière pensée, an arrière pensée, as they'd say in France, but this instinct that we still could be at the intersection of those interlocking circles. Instead, I think Britain has to commit to put Europe as its inner circle, have the United States and the transatlantic relationship as that surrounding circle, and then the bilateral and multilateral relationships after it. Uh, why? Um, as I said earlier, Britain has a difficult relationship with Europe, and a long and historical Euroscepticism, which makes it particularly difficult for politicians to think of Europe being that inner circle. In fact, I think often that's the reason they don't go there, because ultimately this would involve a commitment that very few politicians have had the courage to take. And one has to recognize that British skepticism has been hardened in recent years, one could say justifiably. The EU's focus on monetary union which had a defective design from the beginning, uh, has raised concerns that its further integration could disadvantage the UK. Um, obviously, the migrant issue is one that is a deep concern to many people in the UK. It has had effect on blue-collar wage levels, on social services, even if the aggregate impact has been positive uh, for Britain. Um, and then there is the sort of hypocritical element. Uh, John Major, I thought, made a good point, which I know others have made as well, but. Uh, he made it a, at a speech in Germany just recently that while Europeans are saying, telling the Brits all the time that the sanctity of movement of labor should not be touched, they don't mention the fact that, according to Mario Monti, only about 20% of EU services are allowed to be traded across e European borders currently. Uh, and when you think that services are 70% of EU GDP, uh, that is not exactly the four freedoms that the uh, architects of the single market had envisaged. So why then put Europe in that inner circle. Basically, I think there are three reasons, and I'll say them quickly because we can talk about them more later on. But I think Britain, with Europe as its inner circle, has the best prospects of leveraging its economic competitiveness internationally. It has the best prospects of strengthening its security. And it has the opportunity to maximize its international influence on global challenges. I think the economic argument, in some ways, uh, is the easiest and most obvious, in the sense that as much as people put out, I think just today, uh, there's been the latest big missive serialized, serialized now in the Daily Telegraph about you know, the disadvantages to British business. But at least, I'm not an economist, if I just look and add up the benefits in terms of being able to leverage the weight of a market of 500 million people at a time of growing global economic competitiveness and market opening, it seems to me that the UK is going to be that much better off on negotiating access to these growing markets around the world as part of such a group, even if not every trade agreement looks exactly like Britain would like it to look. As one of its biggest countries, it has the opportunity to at least design a good chunk of that negotiation to its advantages. It's highly unlikely that Britain will get better access for its services in big emerging markets doing it by itself than it would do within the EU. And if I just take one statistic, uh, because statistics tend to get thrown out a lot on the sort of uh, camp that says Britain doesn't get enough out of its economic relationship. 
uh, in just the one year after the EU-South Korea agreement was signed, um, uh, 2011. So in the year of 2012, British exports increased by 57% in that one year after the EU-South Korea agreement uh, was signed. Second, foreign investment. Britain desperately needs foreign investment. We don't have um, the long-term capital playing within the economy. And our ability to attract it, which is connected to the fact that we don't just have, I'd say, the slightly weaker labor laws, but we also have the connectivity into the EU market. And we do not suffer from the disadvantage of non-tariff barriers excluding us from Europe. Again, uh, I hear a lot of people commenting that we're still in the WTO. The tariffs would be low with Europe, even if we were outside. Non-tariff barriers, product standards, regulations, that's what determines your access to a market today. If you're not writing those rules, you will be disadvantaged. Um, and again, maybe I'm going to be over-optimistic here, but one has to go against the grain a little bit. I think the timing of thinking of pulling away from Europe economically, it might end up being perverse. As I said, emerging markets are about to go into the transition to middle income status, one of the most difficult transitions you can possibly make. And who knows if they'll make it. And yet at the same time, the EU and the Eurozone is just starting to take the fruits of structural reform under the whip hand of uh, uh, the reforms that needed to be undertook as part of being in the single currency. It would be ironic to pull back just at the time when Europe might take advantage of its nine economies being in the world's top 20 most competitive and uh, with some of the most competitive companies in the world as well. Second point is security. And this is where I think it gets perhaps more interesting to a certain extent. Again, the EU is by no means a traditional security actor. It's not going to defend Britain against an overt military attack. But that's not what we're talking about in today's world of security that I've described. Ultimately, if you look certainly to the east and even to the south and the Middle East, what will be the main determinants of security? They will be, in the case of looking south to the Middle East, counterterrorism cooperation, judicial and police, border control, all of the stuff that you need to do with the EU, as that is the route through which these threats uh, will move. And at the same time, the ability to pool financial resources, do market opening uh, uh, measures, uh, and bringing material resources to those countries in North Africa and the Eastern Mediterranean that might help them stabilize. Again, most effectively undertaken in collaboration with your EU partners. The East is the same. Yes, it's important to reassure NATO members who are exposed to Russia's revanchist uh, outlook right now through NATO and, and uh, rapid reaction task forces and so on. But the most effective way of blunting Russia's intentions, I would say, in that part of the world is to help strengthen the political governance and the economic prospects of those EU members and neighbors with the weakest economies and governance systems. And ultimately, this is where the EU is most effective. Legal standards, structural economic assistance, energy union, competition policy, energy charters, these are the tools of resilience which will actually keep British citizens safe as well as those countries in an independent position. And sanctions, as we've seen, can impose a cost even if they don't always change policy. The last area is, is more amorphous, and I think needs to be tested, but I'll throw it out here, which is the ability to influence global risks, those transnational risks, climate change, uh, pandemic diseases, cyber insecurity, failing states. How can Britain best play in those areas? I think we've seen already in the climate change space, the UK has leveraged the EU very well. Yes, the EU got pushed to one side at Copenhagen by the big boys, but in the end, and this is in the end process. We're coming to the Paris agreements with now coming together amongst all three big players, China, the United States, and Europe. And with Europe's leadership on renewable energy having brought down a lot of the costs uh, of solar power in particular uh, for the future. But I think also uh, part of the difference is going to be in the future thinking not that just about uh, climate, uh, the issues of digital markets, where again the EU will be incredibly important, privacy for citizens, it's also a question of making individual countries more resilient to deal with the challenges, just like we could make North Africa perhaps more resilient or Eastern Europe in the future. In Sub-Saharan Africa, EU cooperation, both bilateral with France on security, but on trade, smart financial assistance, uh, preferential access to the EU market can be important for Sub-Saharan Africa. In uh, Southeast Asia, piracy, anti-piracy collaboration could be done 
uh, between EU military forces who are less powerful on the security front and much more powerful in the soft security dimensions of sea lane uh, surveillance. And even in the Gulf, one of the big challenges the Gulf will face is not just Iran, but its own energy security in the future as they consume more and more of what were their exports. Energy efficiency and integration are things that Europe can work on and the UK could be influential in that dialogue. Some of these initiatives will fail. Some might succeed. But I think the UK will have a better chance of success if it puts cooperation with its EU partners in the lead in these areas. So let me conclude. Um, I think for the group, the growing group of mid-sized states around the world, like the UK, whose economic strength will never be preponderant enough, regionally or globally, to really be able to be influential, whose military resources and ec economic pull are declining in relative terms, being a key player in a strong regional institution is a critical lever for national influence. And by the way, if you are a strong country with strong attributes like the UK, you can be that much more influential. I suppose my bottom line is I think the UK, it's all about relativity. The UK will be richer, safer, and more influential by committing to Europe as being in its inner circle of its <coughs> foreign security as well as its international economic policy. And should the British people decide, and they will decide uh, that whether Britain remains inside the EU or not, if they do decide that it should, then I think British policymakers need to commit to make the most of this opportunity to increase their influence for the future, both for their citizens and for the country as a whole. Thank you. Robin, thank you very much indeed. Very wide-ranging, and I'm sure there'll be questions. We have about 20 minutes for questions. Please, would you wait for the roving microphone uh, to reach you before you start to speak and speak directly into it? Will you stand, give your name, affiliation, and keep your questions concise? Are there any questions? Right, should we come here? And then there's one right at the back, please, after that. John Wilson, a journalist and a member. Uh, Robin, do you accept that it is the British politicians' concentration on the domestic affairs that has caused this nation's external weaknesses? Wow. <laughs> um, <laughs> Discuss. Yeah, exactly. I, I always say that I have the luxury of not having to be elected. So, you know, I can say what I like up on this stage about what I think is best for Britain, but I don't have to get elected in doing it. Uh, so that's the first point. And if I had to be elected, my main priority would be domestic affairs. I think what I feel British politicians do not do well enough is connect domestic affairs to international affairs. And it's so obvious, actually, in a way. We've, we've done quite a bit of polling in the U uh, Chatham House with YouGov over the last four years on British attitudes to, to you know, what their ambition should be. And the British people are sort of ambivalent. They want to be a great power, but they don't want to commit British troops out to intervention. At the core of it is this idea that the world out there is dangerous. And somehow they expect the politicians to protect them. You can see why if you go through my litany of risks. Um, but ultimately, our ability to protect ourselves at home will be hugely enhanced by intelligent engagement and intervention at times abroad. And I suppose my key theme is here is, and this is the hardest thing for all British politicians to say, is that intervention will be more credible, I think more influential, uh, in collaboration with EU partners and sometimes EU institutions than by itself. And with the US, where, you know, where it counts. We've got to pick our horses for courses. But uh, yeah, it's, I don't blame any British politician for focusing on domestic politics. What I blame them for is not connecting the domestic and the international. Thank you. Um, there's the one right at the back, and then down here at the front, please, and then we'll come here. Jim Shannon, I'm a Member of Parliament for Strangford, so I'm one of those politicians you referred to. Uh, but but my, my question is, uh, in the past, uh, uh, Great Britain has been great because of its uh, colonial base, of its Commonwealth base, uh, backed up by an army and a navy, which had some strength. In the past few years, uh, we have had the, uh, some comments from the United States uh, um, members of, of, of their Senate and of their government indicating their concerns over the reduction in the power of the Army and the Navy. 
Surely if we're to retain our position in the world to influence, we must have more spend on defence or at least 2% GDP spend. I support that, by the way, but I'm curious to get your ideas on that, if you could, please. Thank you. Um, I was involved in sharing a uh, NATO, I think they call it policy expert group in the lead up to the Wales summit or Newport summit um, last year. And we had a bit of a debate about the 2% thing. Uh, in the end, we, we put it in our report. We also added a comment that, if I remember rightly, 20% uh, of the military budget should be applied towards equipment and procurement. Um, because what you find is it's what you spend on is as important as how much you spend. If you're spending on keeping uh, bases that were designed for another era uh, of Cold War type conflict, then in a way is that effective when you've got very subtle, complex forms of uh, intervention coming from the East, from Russia, and highly, also hybrid and complex threats coming from the South and the Middle East. So the content is as important as the quantity. But that being said, my view is if you don't put a target there, then it is a statement of withdrawal in a way. It's, it's a statement of uh, that military power doesn't matter. And I'm afraid I'm, I'm a believer in deterrence. I, look, I think you took the police off the street in London. We all get on very well at the moment, but you know things change. And the world at some level, uh, sorry to go with IR theory on here, but as, as there's somebody, a British uh, IR theorist once said, is an uh, anarchical society. Uh, and ultimately, the society is there, providing it has the protection. 2% is a statement by governments to say, we think defense is important. Not intervention, not military, you know, attack left, right, and center, but that we need to treat this as a core part of our security. It may not be influential, and I think you said influential at some point. As I said in my remarks here, the reason why I think the EU maybe needs to be in the inner core is that um, defense becomes an insurance policy. And the US, in a way, has become our insurance policy here in Europe. But the influence may come less from defensive capabilities and more from the other ones I described. Thank you. Uh, Robert, and then could we have the microphone in the middle here, please, afterwards? Um, Robert with Thorpe Brown, member of Chatham House Council, also chair of the International Relations Committee of the Lib Dems. Um, Robin, could you make some comments about the soft power coming from two areas? One, the fact that we have got a, a universal language and that which we can project our culture through British um, Council and similar bodies, and ESU, for example. Um, and secondly, the fact that we can project quite a lot of goodwill through this 0.7% commitment to, through DFID, um, which is giving us great plaudits around the world. Um, yeah, soft power being the power of attraction the idea that people want to follow you in ideas uh, rather than being kind of forced or coerced even by relatively benign things like trade policy. Uh, in that sense, you gave two examples. Um, and I think I would say that the foreign assistance has the benefit of enhancing our soft power, but actually is perhaps even more important if it is spent effectively in connecting the domestic and the international security that I did in my first question. Because ultimately, I know uh, the Department of International Development and, and many of the NGOs associated with it rightly note the importance of reducing poverty and meeting various Millennium Development Goals and now Sustainable Development Goals later, later this year. But for it to be politically sustainable, it needs to be connected as well to citizens and taxpayers' sense of, of security. And I think this idea that Britain is using uh, some of its resources, hard-earned, and as I said, we're a country going through some very tough periods and tough cuts, but that we understand that actually helping other countries helps ourselves is a very powerful and inclusive message. It's not a power projection message. It's an engagement message, which in the world where every country does, wants to have its own voice and doesn't want to be told what to do, enhances soft power. English... The English language, I don't know. I think it's, look, it's great because we get, I get quite often to moderate a lot of things. Um, <laughs> because people think, you know, we, we have this great facility with moderating. Um, and sometimes, I know from my time in Washington, people think that what we say is more intelligent than what others say just because we say it in English and we can command the language. These are useful <laughs> advantages which should be used. Um, 
But I always remember the Spanish spending a lot of time talking about uh, the Hispanic region, Latino, Hispano, America, you know? And we speak the common language. Well, it doesn't help Spanish soft power, in my experience. Um, what Spanish companies have been able to do in Latin America has take advantage of that language more to go in and take advantage of business opportunities. It hasn't necessarily made the Spanish voice of Spanish government or other Spanish policies more influential. In the end, you know, English is used by America. America has, you could say, has great advantages, but America's power these days is being limited. I, the, the, the danger of the language one, I'll, I'll finish on this point, is that you could find just about every other country is able both to speak English, maybe not as well as we do, but well enough to get done what they need to get done. But they also have their own languages to dominate their own regions or markets, and we can't play in that one as well. So as the British Academy study, I see Helen Wallace here, that we carried out together for British Academy said, it is vital that we don't rest on our laurels of, of the English language, and we really invest through universities, in our uh, public institutions, and in our government departments in language capacity. Thank you. There are a lot of hands going up, so I think perhaps we'll take yeah, two questions at a time, if that's all right. Yeah. So we start with the lady here, and then there was somebody at the back on the far left over there. So if we take those two questions, please. Thank you very much. Uh, Mary Hockaday, controller of World Service English, so actually we could uh, continue that conversation. Um, but I just wanted to ask you actually about the way you characterise British foreign policy. You talked about David Miliband and his thought of hub Britain, and then you uh, used the phrase commercial diplomacy yep. for uh, David Cameron and the coalition government. Is that the phrase that you would still use, that you expect to be the sort of dominant spirit of this government for the next few years, or are you detecting something different? Mm. And the gentleman over at the back there? Yes, uh, Rajiv Shah, ordinary member of Chatham House. <laughs> um, your speech sounded like the opening salvo of the pro-EU referendum campaign, and no doubt it can be challenged uh, very strongly on many of the things that you said. However, we don't have time for that. So what I would like to just say is, you know, there was an underlying assumption throughout your speech that projection of power, influence in the world is, is something good, in inverted commas. Um, I have my doubts on that. I think one has to be careful what one wishes for. And, uh, you know, the other point that you never mentioned was the Commonwealth. Uh, mm -hmm. I think you mentioned it once mm -hmm. in your speech of 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. So perhaps you can say something about that. Thank you. Right. Um, very good questions both. Where will this government go having done hub and commercial diplomacy? I, I think I'm, although this is now a conservative government rather than a coalition government, um, I think this is going to be a government that wants to have a more balanced and rounded set of relationships. That. The, the slight downgrading, if I can say, of the US relationship, the, we'll be solid but not slavish allies, of which there were quite a few opportunities taken. Um, I think there is an effort to re-engage a bit with the US. If the referendum ends up with Britain staying in the EU, then I think what uh, Philip Hammond said here, sitting in this chair actually at Chatham House on June 1st, about actually Britain would lean forward in Europe in the areas where it can be influential, I'll come to influence in a minute, energy policy, single market, uh, some foreign affairs issues, will be where they'll go. So we will end up, I think, with a Britain that goes back to the traditional one I described of trying to tout azimut and looking in all directions simultaneously, which is hub, <coughs> Britain. Uh, the point I'm making is I think if you're in government, I haven't been in government like many people here, but if you're in government, I imagine you've got to choose where you put emphasis. My concern is that uh, governments in general, and this is a bipartisan, tripartisan comment, have not put as much effort as they should be doing into specific relationships in Europe in order to be able to be influential, even if it's going to be in three directions. Um, and ultimately, I would be putting more emphasis back in Europe, given the context I'm in there. But I think they'll go back to a more traditional approach. Uh, commercial is useful, but as I say commercial hasn't worked out quite the way people thought. Um, you know, I thought about this a lot, and I'm obviously, you'd imagine, I'm trying to write up what I'm saying here. So this was an action-forcing event, this uh, speech, to try and make me get my thoughts together, and they're not fully, uh, probably, formed completely yet. Um, but I have a paragraph in there, because I thought I had to answer that question. Um, this idea that, let me just take it another way. A lot of people say, what's Britain's role? 
what does that mean, role? You know, role is, is a pointless word, and, or even position. Ultimately, if a country can be influential beyond its shores, it should be, in my opinion. If you're a government, you represent your citizens. Yeah? Your citizens want to make sure that they are prosperous, safe, healthy, etc., etc. The world outside today influences enormously whether you are healthy, prosperous, safe. From climate to terrorism to economic opportunity. Yes, there are plenty of domestic decisions that need to be taken. I listed them out in my speech. But if you have the ability to influence your external context, take it. Don't be embarrassed about it. Now, don't overplay your hand. Don't, uh, you know, uh, okay, the obvious thing, don't intervene where intervention doesn't help. Or uh, don't perhaps play to old ideas that because we had colonial relationships, they'll become useful relationships in the 21st century. If, that might be a subtext of, 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 of your comment. I've heard other people make that point. Um, but I think if you can be influential, uh, do it. Um, and I think that's useful. All members are ordinary members at Chatham House. <laughs> there was a gentleman over this side who, yes, uh, who caught my eye earlier. And, and then over to Wendy in the middle, please, for these next two questions. Thank you very much. William Crawley, member of Chatham House. I'd just like to preface my remarks about Lord Gardens, as this occasion is in his, in his honour. I once had the privilege of talking on my own doorstep about foreign policy when he was canvassing for a local Liberal Party in the very unliberal constituency of Barnet. Uh, it's just uh, that he had this whole range of uh, uh, experience in policy making and uh, command, uh, as well as uh, think tankery. And, but, uh, Talking about foreign policy on the doorstep was something that very few of your colleagues, Robin, I think... He was supporting uh, me, who was the, the, the Liberal Democrat <laughs> candidate at the but, time. But my question is about an, another topic which wasn't mentioned in your lecture, Robin, the, the right to protect. Mm. Two of Tony Blair's wars, as he liked mm. to call them, were undertaken, mm. or military interventions were undertaken in the name of the right to protect in Sierra Leone and controversially, very controversially in, in, in Kosovo. And uh, David Cameron's Libyan venture was uh, also uh, boosted by the arguments mm. for the right to protect. We haven't heard much about it recently. Syria seems to put a paid to it as far as Britain was concerned. Mm. What do you think about that? And uh, Wendy in the middle, have we got a microphone in the middle there, please? Thank you. Wendy Kerr, Pope Chair of Liberal International British Group. Following on from that question, a hard question, the Baltic states, and indeed Finland, are absolutely convinced that Russia will attack them sooner or later. What effect will this have on Britain's relationship with Europe because they have no choice but, under Article 5 of NATO, to defend? Mm -hmm. Will it, if you take that further, and, and Russia is, is, is repelled or stopped, will it change Britain's attitude to Europe? Mm. Wow. Okay. Um, three very good questions. And of course, you said the other thing you didn't mention in your speech. Of course, I didn't answer the gentleman's question about the Commonwealth. I had CW written down here, and I kept thinking, Cold War? Why was I going to talk about the Cold War? <laughs> um, CW, Commonwealth. Uh, let me just say something on the Commonwealth very quickly. Having actually spent a, a day recently at the uh, headquarters of the Secretariat um, here in London, because I was involved in a, in a search, actually. But... Um, the reason I don't push the Commonwealth, partly in, in, in my remarks, I'm very cautious <laughs> about you know, Britain rah rah in the Commonwealth. I think the quieter the Britain is in the way that it operates within the Commonwealth, the better. But it is, if members of the Commonwealth collectively want it to be what it can be, I think it can be very powerful. Election monitoring, good governance, uh, improving the role of women in economic development, teaming up with DFID. This is the kind of soft areas of change and influence that could be amongst the most powerful in the future. And so I think the Commonwealth, if its members allow it to be what it can be, can be great. I have some skepticism that a sufficient majority of its most influential governments let it be all it wants to be, and Britain ends up maybe not, let it, not being able to encourage it, therefore. So I'm a little ambivalent about it. Enough on that. Um, R2P. Um, uh, responsibility to protect. Um, I think this was a very important adaptation to the UN system. 
the idea that governments are responsible for upholding the values and laws, in essence, of, that are in the UN Charter. And that just because they're governments, and therefore they control the border and the monopoly on violence, doesn't mean that they then can crush those laws. I think it was an incredibly important evolution. Um, Libya has ended up damaging it. In my opinion, you know, again, one has to be in the, in the heat of the matter, and I wasn't. But I sense there was a drift between protecting the civilians that needed to be protected and doing all, taking all necessary means so to do, which is what the UN resolution allowed the governments to do in the Libya operation. But it did drift over into getting rid of Gaddafi. And once it did that, I think you ended up with a bunch of governments saying, hold on a minute, that's not exactly what we thought. And so you've ended up with R2P being um, weakened as a concept at just the wrong moment. I think what is happening in Syria uh, is appalling um, and that it has been allowed to go on as long as it has. I know people say there's no good solution. To, well, then pick which bad solution. I'm on the record as having advocated some type of intervention both in 2012 and later in Syria because I felt that letting things play out, which is the phrase I used, means they would play out very badly. I think they have played out very badly. Um, and I think R2P, responsibility to protect, is a concept that should have been retained. Um, I think the next question was Russia. I keep thinking there were three questions, but maybe the next question was Russia. Um, if it was Russia, and I'm not missing something, um, I don't think Russia and the Russian government is planning to invade anyone. Um, now, famous last words, yes? So, <laughs> I say anyone. Let me rephrase that. I don't think they're planning to invade the Baltic states in the near future. Okay? <laughs> that would be the diplomatic answer. That, that's the one that's on the record. Um, no, because I think in the end, President Putin is a very intelligent man. Certainly, uh, you know, he knows how power works. Uh, I think he feels Europe is weak. Europe is uh, uh, divided. Governments don't trust each other right now. The Euro crisis has left whatever happens with Greece a deep well of distrust amongst the governments. Um, in a way, if, if the MH17 plane hadn't been shot down, I wonder if the sanctions, the sexual sanctions, would have been applied. Um, I think he feels maybe he can wait, and Ukraine will sort of drift back into his lap. As if it does, it'll be as a failed kind of state, and that'll be fine by him. I think Russia is quite happy to have a group of failed semi-failed states as long as they're under their control, black holes, corrupt, not a problem, cordon sanitaire around Russia, perfect. You know, so I think his view is more, I need to protect Russia than I need to expand. You know? um, and if he needs to get into hard power, it'll be very subtle hard power. Uh, it'll be corporate, it'll be money, it'll be corruption, it'll be areas that Angela Merkel uh, is, I think, very aware of. Uh, not just Britain, and not just other governments. Uh, so I think ultimately he knows that if there were to be an attack on the Baltic states, I know there's been some polling done on this. The Pew did a very interesting poll on would you back your government uh, if there were an attack you know, on a Baltic state? And quite a few countries said, maybe not. You know, God, you may have to go for war. For, but uh, worth looking at that poll. Um, but I think in the end, um, uh, there would be the governments would step up. They'd know that if a NATO member is attacked, attacked overtly, and NATO did not stand up, this would be a, a moment that... I'm a big believer governments learn from the past. They might make new mistakes, and they might make mistakes that sort of look a bit like the, new, the last ones, but governments learn. If you look how we've handled a financial crisis, governments have not made the same mistakes as last time. They made some new mistakes, but not the same mistakes. People have learned, <laughs> learned from, from the 20th century that you do not allow an attack like that to happen and not revert. And I think, ultimately, this is a place where governments will step forward. Uh, I, I think President Putin knows that perfectly well. I've been instructed that we can go a couple of minutes over time, but I think if we uh, I know Chatham House is a stickler for time. So can we have the two last ones who are uh, in the front here and then the gentleman at the back there, please, if you could bring... And I do apologise to all those who we haven't had time to call. Uh, thank you. Uh, Derek Honeygold. Um, long-time member of this institution and uh, a member of the British group for 55 years now, half of that as treasurer. Um, 
two issues I'd like to raise. One is this issue of mercantilism. Could you, could you just raise one, because we're yes. right up against <laughs> Well, the they're very short, <laughs> both of them. Well, the first one is mercantilism, the second one is exogenous influences okay. on, on governance. <laughs> the first one, uh, Robin raised this issue of mercantilism. Of course, we know that it originated in 1776, or the economic wow. orthodoxy then, although it took until after the Second World War before it had any mm. meaning. Derek, I think we can't go into more detail. That, yeah. That's it. <laughs> Se secondly, secondly, the exogenous influences, doesn't this demand that we have a greater degree of transnational stroke supranational governance? I'll leave it at okay. that. Thank you. And the gentleman, uh, yes, the gentleman there. Uh, Howard Henshaw, uh, a former overseas director of Standard Chartered Bank. Uh, if Britain pulls out of Europe, don't you think there's a danger of Frankfurt leapfrogging London? as a financial hub of Europe. Okay. Right. Um, on those two questions, uh, I, I know this is, the last question was a question. I think the first one, um, I will comment on mercantilism quickly. Um, I don't think mercantilism works the way it used to, which is why China is being quite intelligent in the way it's handling its rise. And this is one of the lessons learned from the 20th century. Uh, owning you know, controlling territory doesn't bring economic benefit uh, the way people thought it did and the way it in some cases it did in the 20th century. So one of the reasons I'm more optimistic about the 21st century than the 20th is that although there are a lot of tensions, and I describe them in my remarks here, and countries are out to wanting to win in the global economy, they don't want to let mercantilism, if they can possibly help it, tip into war. Now, emotion, uh, atavistic concerns, history, memory, can be more powerful often than economics. Uh, so I'm less worried about the mechanicalism, I'm more worried about emotions. As Dominic Moisey describes it, emotions in foreign policy can, can trump uh, the most logical outcomes. But I think mechanicalism is not as dangerous as it was. And forgive, I think my jet lag's knocked off the exogenous influences part, but I'm sure it was a good point, Derek. Um, on Frankfurt um, leapfrogging um, London. You know, I think somebody said earlier that my speech was a um, sounded a bit like a, a, you know, a salvo in the in campaign for, for the Euro referendum. Um, I'm sure it can be taken that way. Uh, I wrote a piece back in 2010 where I strongly argued that Britain needed to look beyond Europe and beyond America um, to reconnect, in particular with the rising mid-sized powers that wanted British partnership and that offered Britain economic opportunity, and that ultimately, you know, we should obsess less about Europe and actually less about the U.S. relationship as well, which I think is very strong and will remain strong, whatever happens. Um, the reason I wanted to say what I said today uh, is that you can only do that reaching out, as I said, from a strong base. And I don't think I would say this, wouldn't I? I think that's an objective statement. <laughs> uh, it will be seen as subjective by many, uh, but... Uh, the reason I wanted to lay out the global context as clearly as I did was to try to provide the foundation for the argument. If you're going to provide a foundation for this argument, then I think one has to be very careful not to overplay the risks of being out of the EU. Um, if Britain were to leave the EU, I think it would remain a strong, influential, uh, and economically potentially successful country. It has a growing population. It'll be the largest population in Europe. I think even if left the EU, it probably would be as well, um, which gives it a certain material capacity. It would have to work harder to be successful if it was out. So governments would be more disciplined. The people might be more disciplined, etc. cetera. Um, and I think on the financial side, this, rem this reminds you, if the UK were to leave the EU, the EU would be weaker. So you don't transfer UK strength to European strength if the UK is out. So Frankfurt, yes, might take some of the business of London. But you'd end up, I think, with a potentially weaker city and a not as strong Frankfurt. And that's almost at the core of my message about the whole thing. As I said, it's richer, safer, more influential. I didn't say rich, safe. Yeah? This is relative. We're in a world of relative strength, relative power. 
And that's what needs to be focused on. So I think, you know, the city would come up with clever stuff. People want its talent. Uh, you know, we can be attractive. We've got all sorts of, you know, soft power uh, things that would keep us here. And Frankfurt wouldn't have those. But Britain, you know, I think the city would be weaker, smaller, would lose certain types of business. The Eurozone would, would probably pass clearing bank regulations, all sorts of things that would mean certain types of business would be lost. But remember, the UK did very well out of dollar markets when it wasn't in the US. You know better than I do on this stuff. Yeah, one back in the 1970s. So um, my key point, I don't want to overplay out. That's why I'm trying to be as sober as I can about the benefits of it. Thank you very much. And uh, can I just apologize again to those who I didn't manage to call, is, uh, the, but the wealth of hands up, I think, showed just what a thought-provoking lecture this has been. And thank you very much indeed, Robin. You've certainly added luster to the Garden Lecture series, which has had some very distinguished certainly speakers, has. and you have certainly continued that distinction. So can we show our appreciation, please?